Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Monberg. Uh, my colleague Nick Thiel and I work at Hornell Anderson, where we create branded interactive experiences, big and small, analog and digital. We're here today to actually talk about failure, and I consider myself an expert. Uh, it's a taboo subject amongst creatives, it's something that we try to avoid at all costs, but the central thesis of today's talk is that there are huge gifts uh, to be gained by not only engaging failure, but embracing it. So speaking of screwing up, show of hands, who here has been thrown under the bus at work? <laughs> yeah, it's something we try to avoid. Who here has actually thrown someone else under the bus? Yeah. You're all liars. Well, put a pin in it. That, that's, a, that's something that we're going to come back to later, but I want you to be a little bit present to that idea as we go through some definitions of, uh, of success and failure. Nick, take it away. Thanks, Jamie. So we wanted to start with success first. It's easy to um, wrap our heads around this if we think about the positive side of it. So uh, what better example than Coca-Cola in terms of a successful brand? It's been around for over 100 years, and for 100 years, it's been about happiness in a bottle. They've been really great about keeping a consistent look to their identity, and they've stayed true to their brand for over 100 years. On a similar note, you have Porsche. Uh, not only physically is the design a consistent and successful uh, manifestation of the brand, but the brand itself is about the joy of driving and just enjoying the, the, the thrill of the drive. We all know this one, Eames chairs. And it's simple, elegant form, yet highly functional. And the combination of those things has really uh, lent itself to becoming an icon for all of design. It's something that is stuck in our heads and we uh, think immediately about design when we, see about, when we see the Eames chair. Then this old guy. Um, this is kind of crazy. I mean, if you remember or ever had the first iPod, it was kind of a brick, and it was heavy, and it was really expensive. Uh, and yet, this unconventional approach to the UI, and also just an overall great design, really redefined the MP3 player market, and it paved the way for all of Apple's later successes, and of course, little thing like changing the record industry forever. Um, an even simpler example of the zipper. Uh, this is something that is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. We, we all have it, We're, we probably each have a zipper, at least one zipper on our persons today. I have a zipper. Do you? Yeah. Okay, you don't have to show me. Um, but we forget that for thousands of years, we had nothing but buttons, and maybe ties, um, knots and whatnot. So uh, just over 100 years ago, this thing came about and really only came into its prime, what, in the first half of this century, really, or I guess last century. Yeah, the, the point is that some of the most successful pieces of design that we encounter every day are things that we don't even notice, and that, in fact, is, is the sign of them being successful. Right. This is an interesting one. The QWERTY keyboard, which was actually originally designed to slow down typists because the type hammers were going too fast and it would lock up, so the idea was that, well, let's slow the, type, right, the types down, typists down, and uh, get them to type slower. But that part wasn't entirely successful. What was successful is that it's remained persistent throughout all our experiences currently. And if you think about you know, everything from this old typewriter to your iPad or your laptop today, it's still around. It's Some, still very sometimes successful. Sometimes even non-optimal design can succeed over time just right. Through its own momentum, lots of examples of that. Does anyone here use a Dvorak keyboard? It's much more efficient. No. Oh, we got one. Okay, no, I didn't think so. Yeah, Query, Query rules. Some people swear by it. Yeah. And then back to nature. So this looks like success, uh, and actually we don't even know. Like in a in a Disney movie, the zebra definitely gets away. I'm not so certain in this one, but. The truth is it's something like one out of seven or one out of eight times the zebra goes down. The rest of the time the lion actually fails. There's a little bit of a, like an Aesop's fable there in terms of uh, what that lion needs to do to actually get through to its own success. And when you think about 
how much the lion fails, it's kind of crazy to think that they're still considered the king of the jungle. So what was it, 10%, 15% of the time they yeah. don't actually catch the zebra. And it's fascinating to think about that amount of failure and try and apply that to this business world. Think about your companies and if they would actually be tolerant of 10 to 15% success rate. It's kind of crazy. So shifting the conversation, so we know what success is. In some ways, success is easier to define. You sort of know it. You say, Chris Momberg in the building, everyone. Welcome, Chris Momberg. Get on the boom train. When is failure acceptable? Uh, not in a lot of places, but when we look at it closely, um, we'll see that some people use it every single day. I'm one of them. But probably for a lot of us, our first experience with failure is uh, report cards. Uh, the one thing that you don't want on a report card Where's my build? There it is. Is an F. Um, this is actually the uh, college transcript for a one of the former candidates for president. I won't tell you who, although he does not believe in creationism. Uh, he does. He does believe it should be taught, and he he failed organic chemistry twice. Uh, for 12 to 8, 16 years of our life in school, we're sort of we have this pedagogy rammed down our throats where we must avoid failure at all costs. Anything but an F. And the stats kind of prove that out. So over the last sort of 70 years of data and post-secondary school education, we've seen that A's have become far more common. In fact, they're almost half the grades that are given out today. And F's have become far less common. I'm not sure that people got that much smarter. I think that maybe the uh, goalposts moved around a little bit because of our deep and abject fear of failing on something. I studied engineering in school. And uh, here is, uh, if you look closely, this is actually a Dreamliner. And if you can see in the corners, those are the wings bending up. Now, they're, they're made to bend, but if you looked out and saw your wing bending that much, you might be a little upset. Uh, in fact, the, the Boeing guys are, I don't know if we have sound for this or not. Um, they test everything to failure. It's axiomatic for them. They go through. And every object on that plane, um, if you break something, believe me, you weren't the first one to, to break it. And it's because as part of their design process, they go, they go all the way through. They go all the way to the limit. Because if you don't know where something will fail, then you're, then you're a test pilot. And really, shouldn't be one test pilot on a plane, not 300. Anyone who studied engineering also took this class. And so you spend hours and hours, days of your life, building a balsa wood bridge or popsicle sticks or what'd you say yours was, Hallie? Spaghetti? OK. Uh, and then you break it. And you, but you don't just break it in half. You put it on this really expensive load testing device so you know exactly how much force is going to break it. And that tells you things about modulus of elasticity, a bunch of other boring shit. Uh, the problem is that when you don't know when something will break, then you find out out in public. And if you look at that bridge, there are cars on it. That's not a, that's not a good time. Um, you know, we have a longer discussion about keeping up infrastructure, et cetera. But the truth is that when we do, say, interactive design for a website, uh, we avoid failure in most of our design. And then sometimes it gets out in the real world, gets hooked up to a CMS system, and it looked kind of like that, the proverbial train wreck. We're all familiar with the fail whale. Um, that's definitely failure. Um, mo many of you, at least the design nerds, will know uh, that this was a $35 million experiment by Tropicana, um, a delightful individual from New York, Peter Arnell. Uh, he and his firm designed this, uh, redesigned Tropicana. They didn't put an orange on the box. I guess the lid is kind of an orange. Anyway, it was a big failure. And instead of embracing that and reacting it, Peter wrote a 27-page memo to PepsiCo outlining exactly uh, why this should be a success. Uh, he invoked things like perimeter oscillations and the gravitational pull of a soda pop can. Pretty ethereal stuff. When you start explaining your work to that level, um, regardless of whether or not the work is good, it's a, it's a pretty good litmus test that you screwed something up. AOL, I don't even know where to begin. Nick, why don't, why don't you take this one? I mean, do we need to say anything? OK. Does anyone remember this? This is actually, graphically, this is Hornell Anderson work. Um, so the design, uh, the graphic design was executed kind of beautifully and on brand, but it went on a, on a bag that was completely recyclable, but also a bag that was sort of famously lampooned on YouTube by a 
Air Force pilot claiming that the bag made more noise than his jet. Uh, that's a lot of noise. Uh, there was a Facebook site, something like, I can't hear you because my chip bag is so loud. It's like 56,000 followers. Doritos has like three. Uh, you know, th there's, there's something in here that we'll get to more in our case studies, but definitionally, this is seen as a failure because it's a lot of money and got pulled off the market. But, you know, what if maybe Sunchips had somehow owned that or embraced it? Said, oh, well, our chips are crackly loud and so is our bag. I don't know. I'm not a spin guy, but clearly this thing got momentum on the negative end and uh, kept on going. Uh, <laughs> There, social networking, social media, um, you can't throw a rock. You literally can't throw a rock and not hit somebody here talking about it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there other than um, it's not the savior of everything. Uh, Facebook and Twitter aren't the last words. And the uh, corporate graveyard is kind of littered with social media experience, uh, experiments. Unless somebody here actually is keeping up their Friendster account. Is anyone? OK. You can check me on Friendster. Um, Newton kind of famous as a failure. A lot of people say it was a, just it was ahead of its time. It wasn't really ahead of its time. It had a battery life of like 20 minutes. Its own proprietary graffiti. Uh, it was a it was a personal digital assistant. If anyone remembers that. Uh, and it's important that, that Apple always gets held up as the poster child for success. But 15 years ago, even Microsoft had to invest money to keep Apple afloat. It'll be interesting to see over the next 15 years what happens to Apple as they continue to try to. Uh, preserve the momentum they, they've built up with uh, successes in the mobile area. Um, clearly, this wasn't one of them. I haven't seen one of these for a long time. I don't know if they changed the color. I remember seeing one at CES with Bill Gates in front of it. Not a happy man. Uh, the takeaway here is that uh, and engineers see this all the time, and they should see it all the time. So kind of like those bridge people or those airplane people, in the interactive realm, the technologists they load test servers. They look at things like page weight. They try to crash things so that, again, they know what the failure modalities are. It's not some surprise to them. Um, wh where we're going to go is why don't designers try to, try to pick up that thread and learn something from it? And finally, another dig on social media. This is huge now. Still has money issues. Uh, be, be interesting to see where we go with it. Um, let's take a little bit of a step back on, on what failure is. Uh, it can be, in our world, we're an agency. Uh, I don't know how many people here are, but you know, we start out with unhappy clients. The worst thing in the world is an unhappy client. I'm not altogether certain that's true. If you engage a client the right way, you might even learn something from them. I frequently do. Oh my God, the sky is falling, no money. We're not going to get paid, or we're going to go out of business. <clears throat> are you going to die? Is anyone, is anyone, unless somebody here is like straight back from Helmand province, none of us work in a career field that's life and death. And yet we run away from our mistakes and avoid potential problems with our work as if we are actually going to go broke, be friendless, have clients that hate us and die. And, and those aren't really the stakes. And so part of the takeaway from today should be, what are really the stakes in our work and what's holding us back from breakthrough excellence? I mean, and we have to continue to remind ourselves that yeah, this isn't life and death. No one's going to die because your website broke. Um, we sometimes overthink the challenge or overthink how complicated it is and freak out about it. And that's something we constantly remind ourselves and we remind our ch each other that, hey, this isn't brain surgery. We're not designing a plane. It's not going to crash, um, hopefully. Uh, so it's very important. Death is failure. So Want to talk about success a little bit? Yeah. So looking at success, I mean, we can kind of flip failure on its head and think about it, well, yeah, unhappy clients, let's make happy clients. That's, that's obviously one uh, manifestation of success. Money, of course, we all like money. Um, awards, sure, awards are fun too. But it seems like the real success is when your consumers become constituents and they eventually become your brand evangelists. evangelists. Uh, you know, happy clients, money, and awards, that can be faked to a certain extent, but those brand evangelists can't be faked. That's real, that's authentic, that is success. Not that the money isn't nice, you gotta have some money. <laughs> <laughs> so our, our, again, our central thesis today is gonna be embracing failure and for the purposes of, actually, oops, a little quick, uh, for the purpose of, not breakthrough slides, breakthrough work. 
And now we'd like to go through a few cases and try to unpack that a little bit because it's an abstract notion that can feel a little bit simplistic, like, yeah, of course, learn from your mistakes, fall down nine times, get up 10. That's not really what we're saying. We're not talking about determination and, and uh, resolve. We're talking about getting away from your fight, flight and fight instincts and looking at what you do every day and looking at what your setbacks have to teach you. And uh, there's an example of that in every one of those cases, even going back a little bit in history. I like history. The French. Yeah. So at the end of World War II, or sorry, World War I, uh, all the powers that be in Europe were pretty beat up. They're pretty tired of fighting. Uh, but France had a pretty good idea that Germany might come back around again. And so their solution to protecting against Germany was to build a big wall. It was a very big wall. And with minor mod uh, fortifications along the Belgian border too. Now, this wall, if you think about walls, it's 5,000 year old technology. Um, but this wall was state of the art. Meters and meters of concrete, um, artillery emplacements, um, the soldiers even had air conditioning. But the hang up here was that it was still rooted in ancient technology and the generals who planned out this wall had been fighting, thinking about the war they fought in the previous war. So World War I was very much about static warfare where the troops hunkered down in trenches and then there's artillery did all the work. Well, the Germans were not thinking about the previous war because they lost. So they were looking at what's the new technology that's actually coming out of that very mobile-centric uh, technology. And this was more about changing the rules than anything. Germany wasn't playing by the same rules of the previous war. The rules that France wanted to play by, they were playing by a new set of rules. So when war finally did break out, Germany just went around the wall and the rest is history. And what's crazy is that this is a lesson that's been repeated throughout history, whether it's the Huns or the Mongols, you think about the British versus America in the Revolutionary War, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, fighting wars the way you did the, old, the past wars just doesn't work. Fight the next war like you did the previous one, you're probably gonna lose. And, and so people who design for war, whether they're technologists or generals, just again and again sort of don't anticipate the way things are going. I heard an interesting Bill Maher thing the other night where he's like, I believe in funding weapons as long as they have some adversary. It's not really what we're doing today. Now we're just off building you know, super weapons that don't really have any war to fight. Um, I don't think that puts our national security at risk, but it's a great example of just embracing success and money at the... Uh, to try to avoid uh, failure in your business, but maybe not creating a, a good national security system. Okay, we all know these guys. So these guys, are, again, are the, you know, they're, they're the startup kings. They, it's Orville and Wilbur, if you didn't know. Uh, and where they are right now is actually underwater, but this is the way it used to look a <laughs> uh, hundred some years ago. And they are known for experimentation. Uh, they are known for stick to um, what's lesser known is how they ended their careers. So we'll move through that pretty quickly. Here's a little video. They had to figure out a catapult. They, they actually had to solve for three different issues with flight. They had to figure out thrust. They built their own engine. They had to figure out lift. They designed their own airfoils and tested them in a wind tunnel they constructed. And then most significantly, they had to figure out uh, controllability. So how do you couple, roll, yaw, and pitch. Those are the three axes of flying and use them all together. And every airplane today has this kind of layout. In fact, if anyone flew here, you flew here in a twin engine airplane that had uh, roll ailerons in the wings and an elevator and a rudder. We have that same basic layout. It's, we move the elevator to the back, but any pilot would recognize that. They solve for issues of controllability and uh, pretty much everyone today uses that, that basic idea. Um, they continued to uh, create better and stronger airplanes. This is the Model B, 1909. Uh, they patented everything they did as they went. And what's interesting is the Wright brothers, uh, while they were able to embrace setbacks and failure and risk in the development of flying, when it came to developing their business, they lost sight of all of that. They sort of became the original patent trolls. 
and they went around suing people like Glenn Curtis, saying, oh, you can't use our design, you can't use our design. They tried to own it all for themselves, and in attempting to do so, well, they failed. They, they died, not, not poor and penniless, but they, they died uh, without really seeing their, their basic invention meet the kind of business success uh, that they had hoped for, that they did in the aeronautical realm. And that's why today, uh, when you fly somewhere under your seat cushion, it says William Boeing's company and not Orville and Wilbur Wright's. No friendo. <laughs> Nintendo has a special place in my heart. I grew up with it. I've been playing it all my life, and uh, it's definitely a fun brand to uh, be a part of. Um, Nintendo, wh what was it, in the mid-'80s, came out with the NES, and then the Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64, followed by the GameCube. And the first two were breakthrough successes, pretty much quashed Atari. Uh, there was other uh, competitors out there. Sega, for instance, had their systems. Um, but what happened was that as time went on, Nintendo was having a hard time competing on the technology side of things, competing with the, the hardware and the processing power and the graphics. So when the PlayStation came out and the Xbox and those things were just monsters and they were just crushing Nintendo, and it wasn't that there were better games, they were just doing better just visually and it was very much a kind of a cosmetic issue more than anything. And you know, thinking about all that, well, Nintendo could have gone that route, maybe throw a DVD player in the GameCube, that's one thing it didn't have, um, kind of try to uh, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sony and, and Microsoft, but they didn't. They, well, again, this is kind of a recurring theme, they changed the rules. They looked back at their brand DNA and really realized that, well, what is this about? This is about fun, good, wholesome fun. We can not worry about the hardware and how powerful the graphics are and just try to figure out a fun way to play the game, perhaps a different way to play the game, which is exactly what they did. So now you have the Wiimote and you're doing things like baseball and golf and bowling and whatever else, plus some of their original classics like Mario and what have you. Uh, but more importantly, they really opened up this category of casual gaming. Casual gaming isn't necessarily a new thing, but, or it wasn't a new thing then, but it didn't exist for video games before. So it's crazy to think about it, but you know, back then it was mostly just the dudes playing video games. Well, now, what? yeah, yeah. I mean, a couple girls did, but uh, you know, my, my wife and, and some of our girlfriends, they started to play. That was awesome. It wasn't just the dude fest playing video games anymore. The girls were playing. It wasn't just the kids anymore. Now it was the parents playing with them. And so it really revolutionized gaming as a whole. Looking at this slide, it just blows my mind. Can you think about back in the mid-90s, thinking about grandma and grandpa playing video games? Like, it's bizarre. It's absolutely bizarre. But by changing the rules of gaming, Nintendo really opened up a whole new market, a whole new industry for gaming, really, and uh, revolutionized it, hopefully for the better. Now, challenges, Nintendo is facing new issues coming from other competitions, so they have uh, new problems to solve, but uh, I feel like well, they so yeah, somewhat one. ironically, the emergence of the Angry Birds and whatnot, the plants and the zombies, casual gaming on mobile devices is swamping the very same segmentation and demographic that Nintendo was so brilliantly engaged with its introduction of the Wii. And uh, this just goes to show, once again, that even when you do all the right things, you, you look at your setback, oh shit, we're getting killed on first-person shooters, you engage your fundamental brand DNA, which is about playfulness and entertainment, you find a whole new demographic, um, there's gonna be some other competitor that can still come along and eat your lunch. So it'll be interesting to see what Nintendo does over the next few years. Uh, getting out of the gaming world a, a little bit, um, this is one of my favorite stories, Monster, who here likes Monster Energy Drink? Yeah, right. <laughs> Is Jody in here? Jody, you drink Monster. No, you're, you're for a loco girl, aren't you? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Monster versus Red Bull. Um, both basically colored, caffeinated, sugar, fizzy water. That's what it is. You can't really get more commodity than that. They sell for lots of money. The stuff's 
really expensive, and they have very different approaches to the market. And uh, I think there's something to learn there, especially uh, as we look going forward. So let's look at Monster first. Um, Monster is actually owned by a much bigger company. I won't say who because they're a client. Um, last week, Monster uh, was in the news. On Monday, the FDA announced that it was investigating Monster over, uh, I think, five recent deaths in the last a uh, couple of years in one heart attack. Although, news alert, I think the five people that died also had heart attacks, they just didn't live through them. Um, one on Friday, a family of uh, a 14-year-old young woman that died uh, sued Monster directly. She had consumed two of their sodas in a 24-hour period. That's about half a gram of caffeine. Does anyone know how many, like say Coca-Cola's, how many cans you'd have to drink to get that much caffeine? What, any idea? Yeah, like a little more, like two and a half, six packs. Boom, boom, sitting down. And when you have too much caffeine, um, your body goes into arrhythmia and you die. Um, that's not what you want. I, I know I'm being a little bit morbid, but that's their press right now. Um, their brand has all been about extreme and high energy, um, although these are more like themed events that people pay a little bit of money to go to and be entertained. But this could just as easily be uh, just about any other brand that's getting smacked all over a, a motorcycle. Um, we, for example, see that in NASCAR. On the other side of it, we see Red Bull, which we love. I mean, even if you don't like Red Bull, you love the brand because Red Bull successfully has competed with not one, but two highly entrenched global beverage companies and uh, they've done a great job with it. They've experienced almost double-digit growth for their entire existence. It'll be interesting to see where they are down the line, um, but for now, they're known for some pretty cool things. Nick was talking earlier about getting your consumers to become evangelical, and it's, t it's tough to imagine something more evangelical than flug tag, right? So they aren't saying extreme about themselves, they're actually inhabiting it, and um, I wouldn't, I'm scared of heights, I wouldn't do this at all. And talk about embracing failure. I mean, I don't even think some of this shit was made to fly in the first place. <laughs> right, look at these yahoos. I mean, not, no pretense whatsoever. They're just jumping off. People having a lot of fun out there, embracing a brand, being evangelical about it, not taking themselves too seriously. Um, on a slightly more serious note, again, um, I, I think, actually I think Chris and I have been on this helicopter it's just wrapped in Red Bull, but it's believable, right? Red Bull goes along and says, well, what can we do differently? What, what are the vulnerabilities for Coke and Pepsi? And the, the vulnerabilities turned out to be about lifestyle. Uh, these aren't sponsored athletes. These are just regular schmoes. And if you write enough check, you can get on an A-star too. Anyone seen the Red Bull air races? Events all over the world, huge crowds, millions and millions of people. And uh, the CPM for this blows anything online out of the water. Um, very dangerous, although this was canceled indefinitely uh, about three years ago. Um, they came up with this technology for these pylons, and has anyone here seen it? I need to explain the whole thing. 14 Gs, radical crazy. Well, it, it, was, it was canceled for three, well, for the, over the last couple of years because a, a Brazilian who was actually flying an American derivation of a German-designed airplane um, with a uh, I think his name was Adel Adelson Kindleman. He's a Brazilian with a German name as well. There's some uh, interesting globalization there. And remember that open source, non-open source, I guess you'd say, right flyer? Well, you got the German-Portuguese guy flying the American-German airplane. Well, he surfed one into the water. You don't want that associated. You don't want a 14-year-old dying, and you also don't want a, a Portuguese-speaking German name guy dying, and Red Bull figured out that they couldn't handle the stakes. It wasn't about liability, it was about the stakes for their brand. And it'll be interesting to see, do they go back to Flugtag or how do they embrace that? But most famously and most recently, they spent a lot of money doing something else. And I don't know if anyone saw Felix Baumgartner uh, jumping off this thing, but in the name of a brand, uh, that's pretty impressive. It's pretty riveting stuff. It took them a couple of tries. And Nick, what was your quote about this? Well, as we sat there Sunday morning, my wife and I sitting on our couch with our iPad watching this thing, just couldn't help but think that this is the, the space 
event of our generation, basically. Like this is the um, probably the most notable space endeavor of our generation, and it's got Red Bull pasted all over it. And it's just crazy to think this is a drink company, an energy drink company, sugar water, and they're doing this, and they're doing it in such a way it's way more exciting than anything NASA's done in the past 30 years or more. Uh, and it, I don't know, it's just fascinating to think about. What about Skylab? You're what so negative. Well, the, uh, yeah, the, the, mo the, moment, the moment that you realize that your favorite beverage company has a stronger space program than your government um, is a pretty big testament to that company figuring out what ticks correctly in the minds of consumers. And so we have a pretty stark contrast here between Red Bull's approach and Monster's. Although again, Red Bull is vulnerable. Um, while they continue to make good decisions and slice off the bad ones, they, it's going to be tough for them to continue the kind of growth that they have had, again, realizing that what they, they don't really make money off stuff like this. In fact, I think it costs a lot of money. I'm pretty sure that they didn't get that balloon capsule back. I don't know where it is now. Uh, they make money off of selling soft drinks. And unless they continue to engage not only what works, but what is challenging and what doesn't work, um, they're going to get left behind by our favorite people. This is Pepsi and Coca-Cola, uh, 1890s, a little over 100 years ago. Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting study in contrast. Well, while, while these are not the brand, these, the, a brand in this case is like a hot wire on a cow's ass. These are the identities, and I think that they are good proxies for what uh, Pepsi and Coke have done in the, this is the 60s. Pepsi keeps evolving. Coke actually tried some other things too. Remember, is any, well, is anyone here old enough to remember New Coke? Yeah, it was not good. It was not, then we had classic Coke and New Coke, and then, anyway, Coke's back to being classic again. They figured out what works. Don't, don't, it's not, it's not broken, don't fix it. But here we see behavior of somebody who's actually continuing to fail. And in fact, Pepsi isn't competing to be the number two beverage anymore, because they aren't. They're the number three beverage. It's Coke, Diet Coke, and then it's Pepsi. And behaving like this is kind of part of the problem. Uh, it, it's not just showing a lack of confidence, it's showing the marketplace that you'll just keep trying new shit. You'll keep throwing spaghetti at a wall. And this is a lot of times where designers fall down. <clears throat> we go into a crit, we throw a million ideas at a wall, we try to visually pick out the ones that are interesting and then build a brand around that. Uh, Pepsi hasn't succeeded in that, and, and none of us can succeed doing things that way either. Um, when you are so scared of being in second place that you keep evolving yourself, that is a great ticket to third place. Um, I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit to, uh, to Hornell Anderson. And it's just a kind of a quick little note. We, we're not selling anything. We're not selling anything. Maybe a few ideas. We're giving them away. They're free with admission. Um, but we are fortunate enough at Hornell Anderson to have our own experience lab that we call Hacks. And really what it is, it, it, it is a physical place where we can go and do prototyping and build things and, and all sorts of fun stuff. But really when it comes down to it, it's a place to fail. And what's important about Hacks is that we get to failure quickly. Um, the, the, the whole notion of trying to iterate and power through a concept uh, ends up being very pricey and expensive. And th this isn't necessarily funded by uh, client budgets. This is on its own. And so getting to failure quickly means that it then becomes affordable, affordable to prototype, affordable to explore new ideas. And then along with that failure, of course, is learning. And that kind of learning leads, its, leads the way to innovation. So we have to make sure that, sure, we can go out down and build something crazy, build some new touch wall or some ping pong table with you know, microphones underneath it. But uh, the whole point is to learn as we go and figure out how we can apply it. And then ultimately, hopefully someday, apply it to uh, a client application, a client project, something that ultimately does pay us. Um, I love your analogy calling it a foam pit for design. Um, but the whole idea that it is, it is a, truly that. It's a safe place to go in, uh, take a big jump, a leap, and then fall, 
and it's not going to hurt too bad. And a lot of agencies are doing this now, trying to do R&D. The truth is it's very difficult to do that inside a client brief, a client budget, a client timeline, especially if you're as risk averse as I am. Can't afford to jump in the foam pit on behalf of the client and end up like Peter Arnell writing 27-page memos apologizing for it. The, we all need the muscles, though, of what it's like to try that you know, triple corked McTwist into a foam pit. And that's where we build these muscles. Um, and it's something that translates, and we've seen it translate very effectively when we go back to the client sandbox. Oh, so that's... You let me out? No, just keep going. Fail. Okay. Who here is into audio blogging? Yeah, me too. I get a full disclosure, Yodio was a Hornell Anderson client back around 2007, I believe, and they thought that, uh, you know, we'd, we'd seen podcasting, sort of long-form audio blogging that continues to be pretty successful. Um, we, they had the idea that people wanted to hear audio in like little 20 and 30 second clips. Um, so snippet blogging, but done in an audio form. Um, Yodio isn't a verb. There was another competitor in the space, too. Uh, I don't know if I hadn't heard of them. At the, they were named Odeo, so I don't. Uh, has anyone here heard of Odeo? Yeah, Gordon's heard of Odeo. Um, Odeo was highly funded. They were a Bay Area startup darling. They had, or actually, they were in Chicago, but they got a ton of money out of the Bay. Um, and they explored this, and they explored you know, audio blogging. The problem was a lot of people didn't really want to do it. But they had all this money. Um, and there was a young guy there named Jack Dorsey, who, who was an undergrad in college at the time. He was an engineer for them. And he started experimenting with other things. And one of the things he experimented with was an internal tool for people to communicate with each other as they say they were developing something. And it was quicker than the phone. It wasn't audio based. It was still short format microblogging, but it was done textually, more like SMS and less like the telephone. Uh, guess how many characters? Yeah, exactly, 140. So Odeo and some of their founders, they had an ex-Google guy, and I think maybe an ex-PayPal guy, they, they fit BizStone, um, they, they, in, they embraced this. Um, some of them got kicked out of the company and they became part of Odeo as Twitter sort of found its way, floundered into the marketplace, and continues to have huge success um, I'm sorry for the bad resolution here, and this is a little old, but this is the proverbial hockey stick. It's what every startup genius thinks that they're going to have. Uh, and some of them deserve it, and some of them don't. But today, Twitter's valuation, private valuation, is closer to something like $8 billion. It's a tremendous amount of money. Twitter has about 140 million users. Even if you assume that all of those were active, that's about $60 per user. Twitter makes about $40 million a year. That's about 35 cents per user. So I hope. All, who here is on Twitter? Okay, all of you need to keep tweeting and you need to live for 180 years so you can pay these people back because they built this really nice thing for you. Twitter is a breakout success. It's an example of where an engineer embraced the paradigm of microblogging but figured out that it needed to be done more like texting and less like talking on the phone. But Twitter still has the ongoing challenge of really building out a viable revenue model so that they can monetize this without pissing all of you off and sending you on to the next social media platform. And, and that's a real challenge. So we'll see if they can keep that in their DNA. There's other companies, I can, Netflix, for example, who have had it, and they're still struggling today. If you really want to see a company that's going to be successful, um, I'd really encourage all of you to um, get online and Google Boomtrain. Get on the boom train. <laughs> Nick, I'd like you to talk about a design firm. Uh, not boom train? Well, I'd, I, I'm available later on to talk about boom train all okay. you want, but QA, now, boom train. Yeah, you got it. Boom train. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we all remember the 2012 Olympics. Does anybody remember when this identity and brand was announced? I think it was 07, perhaps? Well, I mean, and, and that, I mean, you think about putting that in context, 07, that was actually before the Beijing Olympics, so we hadn't even had our minds blown by that event yet. But Wolf Owens, the uh, design firm who created this identity and the brand, wanted to create something groundbreaking, create something truly different. And along the way, they did. 
Um, but there was also this crazy tide of criticism that came along the way. I don't the, see the Lisa Simpson thing. No one's really explained that to me. Yeah, let's but, not go there. Okay. Let's not go there. Um, it looked like other things, garish colors, kind of offensive to some people. Um, let's see. Um, and of course, Wolf Owens defended their work much in the same way we saw with the Tropicana work earlier. Um, and what's disappointing about it is that they actually knew it was going to be an issue. They knew that this was going to be a problem, and they went forward with it anyway. So when the identity was announced, <laughs> it got lots of press. And you could argue that any press is good press, sure. But rather than getting excited about the Olympics that were coming to town in five years, they're caught up dealing with this. And so it wasn't so much that Wolf Owens was dealing with it, it was the Olympic Committee dealing with it. And they were struggling with this whole idea of, well, are we trying to plan the next Olympics? Are we getting excited about it and we have to bother with this? So the failure there being, well, Wolf Owens, sure, they created something groundbreaking, something different, something dissonant, I think was the word they used. But uh, they hadn't really done a good job of preparing their client for what was going to come after that. Disruption. So sick of hearing about disruption. It is disruption when you upstage your freaking client, your brand agency. You're supposed to get their message out there. If you're up, you know, drawing attention to yourself, as in this case, arguably an overpaid branding agency, you have failed your client. That's not success, no matter if you win awards or get lots of press or 5,000 tweets. You've gotten in the way of the process. You've gotten a little bit maybe into literally reading your own, your own newspaper. Yeah. And, it's, and it is truly a two-way street. I mean, this is one part agency, one part client. This is actually an example of our own work, which I oversaw. Um, this was an exciting opportunity for a client where we wanted to do something groundbreaking, something different, something that hadn't been seen before. And we really wanted to take the opportunity to do something with video, have some ambient video playing in the background, be something different, really unique. Well, what we didn't account for was something like this. When we handed over the code, handed over the CMS to the client, and we get a priv privacy policy page that is completely illegible and is just truly a mess. And that, that's not the client's fault. They don't know better. They, you, know, you would hope they would, but um, that was something we did wrong. That was something that we failed at to prepare them, either giving them the proper tools or at least the proper information to make the right well, Just because we hooked up a content management system with a fancy renderer, we didn't anticipate it would turn into spaghetti. It always turns into spaghetti. If they can get more words in, they're going to get more words in, whether you can read it or not. That happens every time. And if you blame the client for the execution of your design, that's just you making an excuse for not exploring that potential for failure when it goes out in the real world. Because we aren't just building things for the lab or things for the crit wall or things for us to sit around and love amongst each other. We're building things that need to work in the real world. And oftentimes, our reluctance to even consider what could go wrong sort of guarantees outcomes like this. And uh, I know it's true uh, for us and our clients. We love all of them. Keeps the text coming. Appreciate it. And, and, I, and I, I suspect it's true for a lot of you, whether you work at an agency or for a company or by yourself. So we're going to wind up here pretty quickly um, so we can have a, a few minutes at least for, for questions or, or put downs or blame, because I love that shit. Uh, I, I want to try to coalesce out what the key themes are so that you guys take away that we're not just talking about learn from your mistakes. We're talking about like living your mistakes. So number one, failure really is your friend. Um, I know you were scared of Fs as a kid. I was too. Uh, and you know, maybe Rick Perry should have been. That's political. Uh, failure really is the, the world's best teacher. And, and wisdom is something that only comes through setbacks. A lot of us uh, try to build our sandbox in such a way that we only have success and we miss out on everything that we can learn from not just our own failures, but the potential ones down the line. This one is kind of personal and important to me. Remember we talked about getting thrown under the bus earlier? Choke off your blame thrower. Quit it. It's, it's the biggest thing that happens in the, in the world of creatives, where we point fingers at each other. Sometimes we point them at the client. Sometimes we point them at our boss or somebody that worked for us. I just saw Nick take responsibility for something that actually wasn't really his fault. But creating an environment of mistrust and blame is the single biggest thing that we can do to destroy innovation and break out success. And it happens again and again and again. 
Don't tolerate it from other people, and most of all, don't inhabit it yourself. Um, there's nothing good that can come from blame. Nick, talk about something happy. <laughs> we like sandboxes, but love your sandbox. Um, th this is coming back to the point you were making earlier, but that design and development, it's full of constraints. So let's not get caught up on complaining about budget or schedule or lack of assets or that bad CMS, but actually work through them and work through those constraints. Um, blaming the client or other issues, external factors otherwise, isn't gonna really get you anywhere. It's certainly not gonna get you closer to a great product. Tight constraints can actually be a gift. You get to fail fast and you get to fail forward. So look at it that way. Look at it as an opportunity, not as an excuse for why things aren't working out for you. Then accepting setbacks. This is something where, okay, failure happens. Mistakes happen, but then let's learn and move on. Sitting around and talking about them, similar to constraints, is it gonna really move the issue forward? But as long as we're considering them early on, considering those failures or how something could failure, you'll probably be in a better place to maneuver your project into success. Think of a startup, not just a startup company, not just Jack Dorsey, who now is running Twitter and Square. Be a startup every time in everything that you do. Have that fearlessness. It, literally, every project that you take on, that ethos of crushing it that comes from the startup world, yes, I love the determination, but what's most important is that it's almost like failure isn't an option, and it's not like you don't get confronted with a lot of it because every startup does. They get confronted with the failure to find funding, the failure to attract new users, the failure of product market fit. Pretty much everything, you, well you can ask somebody, but pretty much everything you do is a failure for a long time. So you either sit with that and learn it, and learn what is right, and learn from those mistakes, or, or you aren't gonna succeed, you know, outside of lottery winners, which there's a few of them. When was the last time you went running down the hallway with scissors in your hand? It's kind uh, of this fun. morning, earlier. And earlier? I, I love it. I'm planning on it later today. Uh, it's fun. And I haven't seen the latest If it's numbers. not fun, why do kids run with scissors? Why is there even this like, yeah. phrase? People do this. It happened. Oh, my God, don't run with scissors. And I don't remember the last time I heard someone dying from running with scissors. Maybe slightly disfigured, but I don't. I Maybe. Mean, you definitely would have heard about it if somebody actually died running with scissors. There's an there's a app for that. There's yeah, something probably to fix there. there is. But um, it's, it's about balancing risk versus reward. And we are emphasizing run here more than scissors. So be aggressive, be bold, and uh, run and have some fun with it. Yeah, it's like you need to be averse to risk aversity. I don't know how to really say it. We're getting at this nuanced thing, but you need to avoid that. You need to not only bet big, but keep your eyes open while you're doing it. Almost there. Uh, embrace cynics. Uh, I love it. I wish some of you heckled today. I love hecklers. Um, you learn from people who are criticizing you. If you avoid that and don't read your bad press or don't read your bad focus group feedback or just say, hey, I'm an artist, I'm a designer, I'm creative, I can't, I got to shut all that out, then, then you've missed a huge opportunity to uh, learn from it. You're essentially just standing in a mirror looking at yourself or one hand clapping. And finally, um, find success. Emphasis again on the verb. It is something that is found. It doesn't drop, again, outside of a lottery. It's something that doesn't drop out of the world. It is a journey and a path, and there are both ups and downs. And a lot of the things that happen on the pathway to success don't feel at all like success. But the less you kind of take your, the more, I should say, you take your eye off the target and look away from it. Like, when you're snowboarding in the trees, what do you look at, Chris? Not the trees, you'll hit the damn tree. Don't look at the trees. Be aware that the trees are there, and look at the spaces between them. And that's how you'll find success. Um, sometimes you still hit the trees, trust me. Thank you. Thank you for your time. We've got a couple of minutes left for hard, hard, incisive questions. Please, anyone? Uh, anyone? Bueller? All right, then I'll let you guys get to your next show. Thank you very much for coming Thank this you. morning.